Christy uh, on the chamber side will keep that conversation or, or keep admitting people as we get it started with our conversation. So uh, just ahead note, we are uh, recording today's conversation and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, if everybody could mute themselves right now, that would be fantastic. It really just helps us eliminate all that background noise. And if you don't mute yourself, then Jesse might mute your might uh, mute you anyways. <laughs> Um, we do have a chat feature that we'll be using today. Uh, if you could submit your questions that way, it just makes it a little bit easier for this whole uh, virtual piece of it. So thank you all for joining us. I suppose I didn't introduce myself. I'm Kristen Craig, president of the Terre Haute Chamber. And this is one of our advocacy forums. Uh, this is something we do throughout the year typically on um, a Friday early in the month. However, with COVID, our schedule's been a little bit off. Uh, so we're using this opportunity to kind of get us back on track. So today we are really excited to be talking a little bit about public education uh, and have a couple of great speakers who will be addressing that issue. And then I'll do a little plug. Next month, we will be talking about higher education and we'll have the leaders of all four of our uh, Terre Haute Eagle County higher education institutions on the call. So we're really looking forward to these discussions. As we all know, education has played a, a really critical role over the last few months. Uh, well, it is critical anyways, but especially been heightened over the last few months and, and really that integral role they play in our society in terms of services and, and, and just the great amount of, of things they offer to our youth. So with that, we'll go ahead and get the program started. So we're very honored today to have um, Indiana Superintendent of Public Instruction, Jennifer McCormick, joining us for the conversation. Uh, Jennifer is going to kick things off a little bit, share what's happening at the statewide perspective, uh, and then we'll roll into our featured presentation with uh, Vigo County School Corporation Superintendent, Dr. Robert Hayworth. So uh, Jennifer, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. So thank you very much. And first of all, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Anytime I can come speak about K-12 education in the state of Indiana, I'm super excited. So thank you, thank you. Uh, I appreciate just the, the opportunity, but I also appreciate all the efforts that are happening in your community um, surrounding the education of just K-12 and higher education. And I'm gonna throw pre-K in there as well because it is truly a systemic effort. At the state level, I, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. It has not been easy, but I will say overall, our educators, our kids, our families have done a really amazing job. And it's not been perfect, um, but we really, when I talk to superintendents, it's going much better in a lot of ways than we even anticipated. You know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but for K-12, we have beyond the academic responsibilities. We also have that social, emotional, behavioral piece that we're concerned about, and then the physical well-being of kids, including making sure that they're fed and, and dealing with potentially a lot of things, COVID, flu, uh, other things involved with just their physical health. So it has been a lot. Um, it is expensive, which I know many of you understand that. And I only bring that up to certain groups because I don't want it to sound like an excuse, but there are reasons that things are happening the way they're happening. Um, but again, for the most part, it has been, the kids have truly been amazing. I know out of the gate, people were very concerned about the mask issue. They were very concerned about social distancing. They were worried about the hygiene piece of it. And how do we logistically do some things within brick and mortar? How do we also provide those learning platform opportunities for our students and our families who maybe don't feel comfortable coming to the brick and mortar? And in a very relatively short amount of time, you have multi-million dollar school districts that really turned on a dime. And that is unheard of in a lot of ways. And again, are we perfect? Heavens no, but we have really um, really made some progress in a lot of areas in a relatively short amount of time, knowing that our budgets are really an 18 month adventure. So our school boards have had to be flexible, our superintendents have had to be really flexible, our CFOs are probably ready for a vacation or a stiff drink, um, but everybody has really had to approach this in a collaborative and let's get to yes type of situation. And so it, it really has been a, a truly a group effort. Moving forward, I, I just want everyone to know statewide, you know, our goal right now, and it's it usually we're, we're, we're thinking long-term, but there's so many short-term issues right now. 
but just so this group knows long term, I, our term potentially, my political term, ends at the end of the calendar year. But our team is still committed to legislative, um, am I freezing? Um, you're, you're doing okay. You good? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm in one of those areas where connectivity's um, sometimes a challenge, which is unfortunate. Um, but overall, we are still committed to the funding piece of things, to inclusivity, to reliable internet for our students and obviously for our adults and families such as mine, um, single accountability system for the state of Indiana, and then tighter requirements around choice because we have an awful lot of taxpayer dollars that are flowing away from traditional public schools um, that are desperately needed. So we're, we're keeping our eye on short term and long term. So I'm gonna stop there and, and let you kind of guide where I need to go next. I think you've covered a, a you know certainly a, a lot of what uh, the questions we might have regarding what's happening at the state and you know I, I think I speak for everybody just applauding um, the effort that the state has put into this year and really you know keeping us informed it, it it's been fantastic so we really appreciate that and I apologize. I forgot your very important title earlier when I was introducing you. So Dr. McCormick, thank you for joining us today. Are there any questions we have specifically for Dr. McCormick before she leaves the conversation today? I'll give you a minute to type those in the chat. I'm not seeing any pop up, so you might get off the hook a little bit this morning. <laughs> well, we do appreciate you taking a minute to, to share some information. Any, any closing thoughts you want to add before you leave? Yeah, I think it's extremely important. You've got a very um, involved community, and do not take that for granted. I do not overassume that happens across the state, unfortunately. We have some really great communities, but some are more active than others. And here's what I will say. I encourage you, you are super lucky with your leadership. You have Superintendent Hayworth and you have other great building level leaders and other community leaders. You have great universities sitting in your backyard. You gotta continue to be a voice. You, you've gotta play that role for kids. And that is be smart with your advocacy, ask great questions. If you don't know what the fight per se is, ask your local schools like what are the pressing issues and how should we approach it because there's a fine line of looking crazy and looking like an advocate so you know making sure you continue to play that role here's i will tell you from what i've learned over the last four years is i can beat my head against the wall and i have <laughs> um, but as soon as that local level whether it's business folks whether it's parents local school superintendents who have done a great job teachers as soon as they start putting pressure on lawmakers or on the executive offices, regardless of what those may be, things change. And then I get the call to say, okay, what are you doing? Because the local people are getting a little bit ruffled. And as soon as they get that local advocacy, it is very different. So please know that your voice is incredibly, incredibly important um, and it needs to continue. Yeah. Thank are you. There we some questions popping up. Yep, there was one question about the um, about the Indiana Ed dashboard and when that might be available. I know that's something that you all have been working on. Um, are we referring to the academic dashboard or the medical? Do we know? I think they're referring to the academic dashboard. Oh, medical, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, so that kind of is housed and is being driven by the state health department. So we have been a partner in providing, providing them with the data necessary to develop that, but that falls under the wheelhouse of the health department. And it's interesting because um, many of our districts are already participating and starting to plug their information in, but we still have, uh, last I heard, about a third of our districts that aren't really putting things, in, putting information in. But here's what I will say. I don't think that's a reflection of them trying to hide or not be transparent. It's just I don't think necessarily everybody realizes what they, if you're in a small or even a large district, you have limited capacity in your hands. I mean, you, you have a lot on your plate. And so many of those districts are trying to tackle quarantining students and making sure they have enough adults to, to operate and making sure they have the bus drivers to get the, to get the fleet on the road and go. Um, so there are pieces of that that I don't think it's because of a lack of we're trying to hide anything. I think it's a result of 
we're trying the best we can and we will get to that. But it, it is up. And like I said, some districts are already participating, but it's not complete by all means. And I, I'm not sure it will be, to be honest with you. I also know too, it's very fluid. And so I'm in a area in the state out Fountain County, north of you, um, that, you know, this week we were on fall break and that fall break ended up to stretch out because there have been positives at our school. And um, so we're e-learning at my husband's administrator. So we're at home um, with some of that stuff right now. But that will continue to be fluid. And in that moment, the administrators are incredibly busy. So it'll come and I'm glad people are paying attention to it, but it's just probably not where it needs to be for a lot of, uh, not excuses, but a lot of reasons. Thank you for the update on that, much appreciated. Well, I think that that's kind of closes out that state portion of our program. So again, Dr. McCormick, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome to stay on the conversation for as long as your schedule permits this morning. We're, we're very pleased to have you. Thank with, you, I appreciate the invite. With that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Rob Hayworth, who is superintendent of the Eagle County School Corporation and allow him to give a local update. So uh, Dr. Hayworth, take it away. Oh, very good. Good morning, friends. Uh, it's good to see everybody's entire face. Uh, we were at the uh, Tarot North football game the other night and people were walking past me and I didn't recognize them because they had a hat on and a mask on and all I could see were their eyes. So it's good to see all of our friends here this morning. Uh, thank you to the chamber uh, for taking this time to shine a light on public education. Uh, very much appreciated. And thank you, Dr. McCormick, for uh, taking the time to be here. We understand how exhaustive your schedule is, but we very much appreciate your service uh, for our children. Our students appreciate it. Our school boards appreciate it, our teachers and staff. So thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule here this morning. It's much appreciated. Uh, I think um, uh, before I would go on, I would ask us to uh, lift our prayers up, lift our thoughts up right now. I don't know how many of you have been following the accident uh, involving uh, St. Mary's. Uh, so if you would keep them in your prayers, a, a car accident last night involving some students. I don't know a lot of the details, uh, but if you would just keep them in your thoughts, in your prayers. Um, you know, when I uh, think about uh, the Chamber's vision uh, to build a vibrant, growing, sustainable business economy that provides prosperity and quality of life, not just for Vigo County, but for the region, I have to imagine the role that education plays in making that vision a reality. And, and not just K-12. Uh, daycare, pre-K, post-secondary. Uh, we have the good fortune in our area to have union training centers. You know, when I think of that education, that professional development that's needed uh, for the small business uh, or for that large uh, corporation that's, that's here that needs professional development, needs education. Again, when I think of that vision of the chamber, build vibrant, growing, sustainable, providing prosperity. I don't think that can happen without collaboration and teamwork between our business community, our educational community, and the political entities that surround us all. I believe the last time that we were all together discussing Vigo County Schools and public education was last February. Think about that. Uh, we were coming off a state of the schools address. And Kristen, if you'll remember, we were coming off a education business roundtable in February. At those events, I think the goal was to start a dialogue that would lead to action. Action that would build upon the successes of the past and bring even stronger relationships between the VCSC and the greater community. Who knew, who knew what would we be facing just a few weeks later? Um, I can say with almost absolute certainty, I did not. 
Um, and there, from that time, and probably like many of you, there has not been a day for me since March 13th that COVID has not been on my mind or has consumed my ever, ever waking thought. And I'm sure it's true for you in your private lives and in your business lives. And then as soon as it came, I immediately felt sorry for myself. I, I was like, I have no training for this. There's nothing in my bag of tools that can help me in this leadership position. And then someone reminded me that, Rob, uh, teachers didn't train for this. Cafeteria workers didn't train for this. Bus drivers didn't train for this. Parents who are now <laughs> delivering education at home did not train for this. And soon after that little pity party, we got busy just like the business community did. We got busy building the plane and flying the plane all at the same time. You know, as businesses were thinking about how to keep their doors open, what do their business models look like in the age of COVID? We were thinking, how do we build a remote educational system for 14,000 students, for nearly 14,000 students and 2,000 employees. Um, and again, not prepared for it, but had to do it. I, I should say this real quick. My hat goes off to our director of HR, uh, Michael Cox, uh, year into his position, new to HR and having to pull together uh, all of those concerns regarding our employees as anything from healthcare related to am I going to have a job. So uh, today again I would like to thank the Chamber for shining this light, but I also would like to use this opportunity to re-engage, to jumpstart that conversation we had hoped to have had in February throughout the summer months and leading into uh, this winter. For some time now, uh, you know, we have been talking about Team Vigo. Simply put, I believe our children and our collective and individual futures go farther when our community works together. Let me give you an example. Our community during the months of March, April, May, worked together to provide breakfast and lunch for our children local churches, non-for-profits, our county blue truck Calvary, all came together to serve over 300,000 meals. We had private businesses that were giving meals away to students or discounting meals to students. One thing I should note, in all we had 35 grab-and-go uh, food centers. I cannot find one district in the state of Indiana that had more opportunities than what we did here in Vigo County. It is in that same vein of teamwork uh, uh, and, and collaboration that I hope that as we re-engage this discussion on uh, the relationship between VCSC and our business community that we approach it that exact same way. That in post-COVID, we not only build up on our successes, but we look to try to become new, innovative, provide sustainable opportunities to take our children uh, to places that they never dreamed that they could get to. You know, this time last winter, we were asking Team Vigo for help. Think about October of last year, we were asking help in identifying opportunities to reduce costs, and help with a 16 cent referenda. That 16 cent referenda was to help support teachers, student protection officers, guidance counselors, nurses, uh, behavioral interventionists. Without the referenda, we told our community that we would end the year with a cash balance of somewhere between four and five million dollars, and that we would have to lay off several employees. We also said without the referenda, if there were not significant operational changes, by 2021, the cash balances in both the education fund and the operation fund will have been completely exhausted. 
with the referenda and with operational changes, we said, we predicted that our cash balance would fall somewhere between 12 and $13 million. And with a few months to go, I believe I can say with some certainty that that's exactly where our cash balance is going to fall. Keeping our commitment, but also thanking you uh, for your efforts. The referendum was one thing, the operational changes were another. As part of those operational changes, we told you that in 2020, we were not going to buy school buses. We didn't save the school corporation $1.7 million. As part of those opera operational changes, we told you that we were gonna put a task force together to determine the right size for our district by closing two elementaries in 2021, one elementary in 2022. That task force has been put together and we believe they will be making a recommendation shortly. The task force also looked at uh, alternative education. So what we have done, we have consolidated alternative education programs, and by doing so, we have closed McLean High School. As part of those uh, operational changes, we stated that we would reduce administrative costs and we have done that and will continue to do that as we right size the district. Although not figured into the end of year cash balance, but was part of our uh, 2025 strategic plan, we told the community that we would sell the administration office and locate into a school that was closing. We have sold uh, the administrative office and we will be looking to relocate our offices in the next few months. All the way through this, we believe that we have kept our commitments uh, that we were promising in October, uh, but the work is not done. It needs to continue. We have made progress, but there is still a long way to go. An area, and, and I say that knowing that we have made progress, an area that we have not made progress in, facilities. COVID-19 has slowed, slowed our progress in the area of facilities, an area I hope we can jumpstart soon. And by jumpstart soon, I hope we can do that this month. Here's what we have been able to do. Architects have completed our facility analysis. They've been researching alternative financing options, and many of you on this call have been a part of some of those discussions. Uh, we are behind on the development of the multi-facility plan. The high schools get a lot of attention, but we need to think about our entire operation and all of our facilities. And because of COVID, we are behind in hosting community forums on what to do with our high school, high schools. At this time, we are not in a position to present a facilities plan for board consideration, which means a May referenda on the high schools is unlikely. Not impossible, but unlikely. Why? That process of thinking about our high schools has to be talked about. It has to be debated. It has to have opportunity for our public to provide great input. The question that I would also like to ask goes beyond whether it's new construction or renovation. I would like to ask what are the greater purposes of these facilities beyond K-12? How innovative are they for our community? How do they help the chamber reach its vision? How do they attract and retain uh, people to Vigo County? How do they serve students and adults beyond three o'clock? I'd love to have those conversations and we're gonna run a little test here uh, at the end of this month. To start this process on the 21st and 28th of this month, we'll be hosting a virtual meeting regarding the facility improvements at Otter Creek working at a gym, cafeteria, and music room renovation. 
we want to use a virtual format to get feedback, but we also want to see if this virtual format will be successful in helping us talk about larger uh, facilities issues. Beyond facilities, beyond budget, uh, those things in the strategic plan, our business is educating and growing children. On March 13th of this year, we told our students and families that we were canceling school. At that time, we did not realize that we would not be back in session for face-to-face -face education. A week earlier, I had told Dr. Karen Gower, our deputy superintendent, and probably the most optimistic, positive person I've ever met, can you create a remote learning curriculum given that we had very little digital contact with our students and staff. Within 10 days, she had delivered, her and her team had delivered that process uh, that carried us from that March 13th date throughout the end of school. By mid-April, it was clear that we were not coming back, and so we changed our focus for preparation uh, for the year to come. By mid-April, Dr. Goler, her team, the director of technology, Doug Miller, who had not been in his position uh, for, uh, he'd only been in there for several months, and our business office, led by Donna Wilson, set a course to take our district to one-to-one. -to -one. In grades three through 12, we are one-to-one -to -one today. What makes that incredible is that when we passed the strategic plan in February, we had no learning management system and we had no devices. But we had a plan to be there by the fall of 2023. So that operational team delivered 48 months ahead of schedule, which is pretty incredible. And it not only revolves around the devices, with the help and assistance of our teachers association Several hours of professional development have been provided for our staff so that they were ready to meet the challenge and we have ongoing professional development. I should say this, more impressive, uh, and this occurred with board approval, that team leveraged Federal CARES dollars and a generous gift from the Education Foundation to take us from to one-to-one -to -one for a total operational cost of $1.8 million. Let me say that again. We went to one-to-one -to -one grades three through 12 for an operational cost of $1.8 million. You, you see 13,130 Chromebooks actually prices out at 4.5 million. Our team made the wise investment for our future using 2.7 million federal CARES dollars for the long-term investment. Pretty incredible. But it's not doesn't stop there. Team Vigo uh, went further. Again, with board approval, we applied for state dollars made available through the Gov Governor Holcomb's GEARS grant. We partnered with JOINC, we partnered with RJL Solutions, we partnered with local churches, we partnered with firehouses, and with the support of Indiana State, Ivy Tech, St. Mary's, Rose Holman, the mayor, the commissioners, the chamber, and many others, we were rewarded $1.4 million to expand broadband coverage throughout the county. Again, leveraging dollars for the long term and we believe for the greater good. I should also point out that we use some of those dollars to turn our buses into hot spots. So I'd like to thank Rick Long and the Transportation Department for creating 130 hot spots on school buses that can be deployed into neighborhoods. TV goes alive and well. Some other things that I could talk about and just would like to mention real quickly. I could go on to discuss that with the help of the NAACP, the Interfaith Council, the Human Rights Commission, the Will Center, Indiana State and St. Mary's, we created a job description, interviewed and fulfilled the strategic plans call 
for a director of inclusion, civility, and our international student residency program. His name is Mr. Matthew McClendon. Or I could discuss the impact of our director of communications, Mr. Bill Riley. He has uh, taken our district uh, to new levels of communication. If you have children within the school corporation and you know you're getting a call from Bill Riley, you know something is up. Uh, in fact, I think he now has mugs that are made in his likeness for people expecting those calls on early mornings. But in all seriousness, he has changed how we communicate. He has created social uh, media platforms that allow us almost instant contact with our community. He's changed our branding and I believe next week he will launch a brand new website for our district. I could discuss the academic leadership shown by Dr. Stacy Mason, Dr. Christy Fenton, the director of CTE, Doug Dillion, Robin Smith, and the new CTE president, uh, uh, Jody uh, Buckaloo as they have guided us through this. A, B schedule, hybrid education, virtual school being offered at the elementary, middle school and high school level. Not to mention the introduction of a new semester seven period day at the high schools. And we could go on. I'll finish with these last few thoughts. But when I think of Team Vigo and where we're at right now, I would like to draw your attention to the COVID-19 task force. How do you guide a district through a global pandemic? Before developing the task force, I would guess we had 50 different dashboards we were investigating. And every morning we would come in after we thought we had the correct dashboard and throw it out because we could find loopholes. What we were hoping for those dashboards to do is to tell us when to bring students back, how many students to bring back, in what ways should we bring those students back. But every time we came to a decision the next morning, we could punch holes through that. Then Dr. Tom Balatevich, Director of Student Services, and Eleni Miller, Head of Nursing, brought the idea of a task force. A task force comprised of professionals representing various areas would come together to discuss several indicators in and out of school to help guide our steps. A team that included doctors, health department officials, teachers, nurses, community members, administrators, working together to discuss and make recommendations under when and under what circumstances to have school. They told us when to proceed and when to slow down when to stay in what we're doing or when to go on to a different model. This team was thinking about Vigo County's most precious gifts each and every day and the teachers and the staff who guide, guard and direct their lives during the school day. I applaud them for that service. They're, they're all volunteers and they will continue to walk down that path for the next several months as long as COVID-19 uh, is with us. I applaud also our frontline workers. You hear frontline workers at the hospitals, we have our own frontline workers, teachers, educational assistants, guidance counselors, interventionists, SPOs, nurses, custodians, bus drivers, secretaries, cafeteria, maintenance staff, building principals that lead those operations at the building level. They make school work that are making school work with COVID, masks, social distancing, and all magic is happening in our buildings and our children are learning. I hope, I hope because of COVID, we have a different appreciation for our teachers and for those that choose to serve in the education of students. I hope that because of COVID, more local control can come back to the local school board in areas like teacher evaluation, letter grades, how we spend our dollars. If we at the local level are given the charge of deciding what educational model best serves in a global pandemic, 
when positive cases and quarantine are given to us to make those decisions and how we handle those, then maybe more educational matters can come back to the local level and to the local school board. Again, I'd like to thank uh, the chamber for giving us this opportunity to show a light on shine a light on uh, K-12. Uh, I could have probably gone another 30 minutes just on trying to identify those highlights. I'm sure I left people that have contributed during this COVID period out and I'm sorry for doing that. Uh, it's we have such a significant positive team uh, working on behalf of our students. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hayworth. It has certainly been an, an interesting year and you all have navigated very well. And like you said, it's not just you, many, many team members for the Vigo County School Corporation. So thanks to all of you. We do have a couple questions. Uh, we're joined today by Sarah Smith, who happens to be the chair of the Chamber's Board of Directors this year. Uh, she's also lived through an interesting year. <laughs> uh, so she had a question about kind of who is going to be retaining ownership of those facilities that you talked about uh, closing, especially that elementary schools you know if one of the chamber's main goals is to look at increasing population I know that that's a goal that uh, you're on board with as well so you know how do you see that rolling out it and what do you see the ownership of those facilities looking like uh, I think we will retain them um, obviously we have uh, Sarah you're over here so if I'm looking over here that's because on my screen you're over here um, retain those facilities uh, in doing so, we will look to locate our office as well as ask Covered Bridge Special Ed Co-op who leases their facility to join us in whatever our new central office will be. Uh, I think we would look to have some creative partnerships to possibly expand on daycare, pre-K in another building. Uh, and really then trying to create an educational pathway for early child education, hopefully with our higher ed partners. Um, crazy out of the box thinking is, can you turn facilities into apartments for first year teachers uh, as a part of an incentive package to try to draw them here to Vigo County? Uh, so there are many options on the table. Um, I will say this, uh, if we were to let those buildings go, there would be the opportunity for a private or a charter uh, to acquire that building at very minimal cost. Uh, so we will try to retain those buildings for educational uses and uh, continue to try to provide public education the best way that we, that we can. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot. I like the outside of the box thinking though too. I think that that, that really gives you a lot more opportunities. Um, clearly, yeah. um, I just hate to see something. Those those a lot of facilities are in really pretty good shape um, as far as the elementary schools are concerned. So I really hate to see those buildings go to waste if we need them in three to five years. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, who knows what legislation changes? You know if. By some chance pre-k funding comes to uh, state uh, we would have to reopen some of those facilities to be able to do that yeah great thanks looks like we had another question about you had mentioned some virtual meetings on october i think 21st 28th somewhere near the end of the a month if you had times for those yeah so um we're going to try this uh, meeting similar to this. Uh, we are uh, working with Otter Creek. Uh, I think everybody understands it's our third largest populated school. And with Otter Creek, uh, they only have one gymnasium while all the other middle schools have two. They converted a teacher workroom into their string orchestra room and they have a split cafeteria that um, needs to be updated and they lack classroom space. So on the 21st and the 28th, we will be hosting virtual meetings. 
I think you can get onto our website and see how you can sign up for those. I think uh, they will hold up to 300 participants. And simply we're going to try to engage the Otter Creek community, the feeder elementary schools into Otter Creek and have a discussion about the future of that building. Uh, so we're hoping to use that uh, to decide to make decisions for Otter Creek, but we're also seeing if that is an avenue to re-engage our community in a much broader conversation regarding facilities. Great, we have another question coming in about just what exactly this experience has looked like with the kind of reopening of the elementary schools to five days a week. And, and now I know that you're announcing plans for um, middle high school, both, <laughs> to, to start to resume those schedules. So how have things rolled out with elementary? Uh, so far, uh, we believe we are able to stay in front of mitigation efforts um, we were rare in the state of Indiana for those schools that had split A, B schedules. I think there were only three districts that also offered the A, B split at the elementary. A uh, number of reasons why uh, we chose that model, uh, but we believe it's been successful. I am worried about what the end of this week's numbers are looking like as we look to bring back middle school next week. Um, but for me and our team personally, it's as if we wake up every day and there's two and a half inches of snow and it's 18 degrees outside and we've got to decide what are we going to do with school today. Uh, and that's where the task force has been very helpful. Um, so uh, we think we have done a good job. Uh, some people might think we could have done better, uh, but we think we've done a good job and we think we are ready given the numbers of where they are. Uh, we'll see what happens over the weekend. Uh, fall break scares us, uh, where people will go and what they might bring back. Um, but I think we're up to the challenge and we'll see what happens next week and then finally for the high schools. Great, thank you. Well, that is all the messages I'm kind of seeing rolling in in the chat. I, you know, just really want to to thank you again for taking the time to do this. So, you know, as the chamber has rolled out some of these big goals, increasing population, increasing per capita personal income, we know that those cannot be done alone without many, many community partners, and really critical of which is uh, both our K through 12 education and higher education. So, we really appreciate you taking the time to kind of shine a light on what you all are doing and, and keep us informed as you know we all continue to walk through this process so I don't see any more questions rolling in on the chat so with that we'll just close it um, I would remind everybody that we will we did record today's conversation and we will be posting it on the chambers YouTube panel uh, for anybody to go view later on so dr. Hayworth any any final closing words no just uh, thank you for this opportunity and for the chamber no, uh, we want to be allies, see us as uh, helpers, builders, whatever you need us to do as we try to move uh, Vigo County and Terre Haute forward.